What's going on, Wolfpack? My name is Denarik Wolf, and welcome to some more Bosnian Reacts 2 Geography Now Singapore this time. Okay, it has been a while, and also Paul hasn't put up any episodes that much. <laughs> same, same as me. But um, I didn't put up episodes because of different reasons. I was dealing with the after aftermath of my pneumonitis. Technically, I didn't have pneumonia. I had something called pneumonitis. Well, they're similar, but... Pneumonia is caused by bacterial or viral infections, while pneumonitis is caused by chemicals, particulates in the air, pollution, anything else that can, you know, inflame your uh, lungs, basically. Even, like, uh, bird feathers can inflame your lungs. Everything can inflame your lungs, apparently. And uh, I was dealing with the aftermath of that. Now, I had to constantly go and get uh, get some more uh, checkups through the doctors, through the pulmonologist that was checking my lungs, making sure I didn't end up with something called pulmonary fibrosis, which can happen after you, uh, can happen after you get a bad, uh, condition of pneumonitis. Uh, basically what, what happens is your lungs become scarred. That's right. You heard me. Scar tissue happens similar to what you see like on people's faces, you know, their, uh, their skin is scarred, but it doesn't really matter if, you know, your skin is scarred. That'll just give you something to uh, talk about at a party, I guess. But if your lungs get scarred, that's bad because lungs have to be very elastic and the, the scarry tissue can't, you know, expand the lungs as easily. Also, if it, if it's, uh, if the, if the fibrosis happens on your alveoli, that can be extremely bad. Like, uh, pulmonary fibrosis can even be a terminal illness that, yeah, people can die from it. So I had to make sure that nothing like that was going to happen. The pulmonologists and doctors ensured me we don't see any signs of any fibrosis happening on your lungs. You're a young guy. It shouldn't happen to you. Lo and behold, it didn't. I feel a lot better now. I'm feeling constantly better, and hopefully I can finally get back to my regular life. Okay, that was just me ranting for about, what, two minutes now? Sorry about that. I just had to get that off my chest. Back to geography now. Also, people keep asking me, are you just going to do geography now and that's it, nothing else? I I am hoping on uh, doing my own videos, but as you can as you can tell, but the pneumonitis that I had, my lung, the, the lung inflammation that, that I had uh, really stressed me out and I couldn't really think straight, first of all, so... I really wanted to get that, get rid, of, get rid of that first and foremost, and then we can go back to our regular scheduled program. And if I don't upload anything else uh, by the end of this year, which I don't know if I will, Happy New Year's to, to everyone. This year was the worst. Let's be frank with each other. And I honestly, I'm I'm going to be a uh, doing something like a moment of silence uh, when New Year's Eve, when the, when it hits 12, 12 o'clock at midnight. I'm gonna be ha I'm gonna be doing a moment of silence. I'm not gonna be like doing fireworks or anything because this year was terrible and there's people still dying from the you know what virus. So let's just uh, for me I'm just gonna keep it you know low. <laughs> Back to Singapore anyway. Now Singapore this is micro nations are some of my favorite mo most fascinating nations in, in in the world for me at least so things like you know Luxembourg like Liechtenstein like Singapore. Well I guess Singapore isn't really that much of a micro nation. It's has more people in it than Bosnia, so maybe Singapore is like on the edge of micro, not so micro nation, but it is hella rich. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I wanted to get that off my chest. It's kind of funny because the name is Singapore. It should be Singa rich because these guys are rich. One in every six, six Singaporeans. I don't know if Paul mentioned this in the video is a millionaire. That means they have a million dollars in expendable income, not just in property and uh, cars or whatever, but actual expendable income. How do they do this? Well, let's find out. <laughs> Paul. All right, Singapore. If any of you guys saw my older videos, you'll know I had I have an amazing experience of visiting this country a couple years ago. My Singaporean friends, Nigel, Ben, and Kevin will be appearing again in this episode. I will say, I get why Singapore is such an internationally renowned hotspot. It's a small country with big ambition. It went from a few dilapidated wooden stilt homes and boating fishermen to literally a boat on top of three skyscrapers. Either. Uh, is that an actual boat or is supposed to represent a boat? I'm assuming it's supposed to represent a boat. But Bosnia did the opposite. We went from, you know, from riches to rags instead of like Singapore from rags to riches. It's a sad story. Trust me. Way, one thing's for sure. Singapore definitely isn't Singapore. Oh, you made the same <laughs> joke. Is it my turn? Yeah, I got to hit Paul with something. I don't know. <laughs> 
I'll just uh, hey everybody I'm your host Barb. Welcome to coffee the Jewel of Asia, coaster. the only place in the world to have gotten their independence against their will. We'll get into that later. But one thing you can do on your own will is get a Geography Now mug or t-shirt or drawstring bag at geographynow.com. 12 bucks for a mug. My brand. Oh sh In any case, get ready cuz we're about to look at the globe I might and find get this some gem of a nation <laughs> in 3 Geography two, Now. Singapore Stuff or later. Pulau Ujong. Anyway, it's the world's only island city yeah. state. Something is clearly happening here. So let's go to the globe. First of all, the country is located in Southeast Asia, just at the southern tip of the Malay Peninsula. To the west, you have the Strait of Malacca, and to the south and east, you have the Riau Islands of Indonesia. Singapore is made up of one main island, Singapore, which makes up about 95% of the country's landmass, as well as 63 other smaller satellite islands. Surprisingly, despite having a large population, they still have a lot of green area, which which is impressive for me because they fit like, what is it, 5 million people on that small of a place wow, and still have room left over. I don't know if this is like a military base or something. I'm sure like actual Singaporeans know what the rest of this is used for, but... It looks green, so <laughs> it's nice. ...and islets. More are actually set to come as they do extensive land reclamation projects, creating Just new like artificial <laughs> islands. In fact, to this day, Singapore has actually increased its land mass by 22% since independence through land reclamation. In fact, if you look over here at the Tuas Peninsula, you can even see it is currently being reclaimed every day and is set for completion by 2030. Over here, Jurong Island was actually a merger of seven previous islands reclaimed into one and is now used as an industrial complex. Besides Singapore Island, though, only two Impressive. other islands are residentially inhabited, Pulau Ubin and Sentosa Island. Otherwise, the rest are used for other purposes like the military, laboratories, wildlife. Uh, sorry to butt in again, but I'm noticing Pulau is, means, I'm assuming, island in like Malay language or something. But there's also a country named Palau. Is there any connection there? Is it because Malaysian? Because it is an island nation, right? So, I don't know. I was just I just thought of that right now. Life sanctuaries and so on. Now, the country doesn't exactly have any official administrative divisions, but when it comes to building sections, there are five development councils that cluster communities together, mostly for government housing projects. When elections come up, though, they do have group and single member constituency neighborhoods. These areas are allotted a certain number of seats in parliament so as to allow a somewhat balanced representation of people groups in the country. Although the country is only about 725 square kilometers in size, making it the 20th smallest country in area, they actually have a lot of air transport. 20th. They have seven military really airports micro, and airstrips man. and two public airports. Yes, two. Everyone thinks Singapore's Changi International, voted the best airport in the world for several consecutive is years. That, oh, and that's the, the one with the only waterfall. One, but, if you go but this is actually like the largest internal waterfall in the world. They really like their waterfalls, I noticed in Singapore. Uh, despite like maybe not even having a natural waterfall, they like their waterfalls. I don't know if they have one. Maybe they don't. It doesn't look like they have any rivers of any sort. Like I don't think an island of this size and being super flat would give them ri rivers, really, but what do I know? Just 16 kilometers north, you'll find this hidden little guy, Selatar Airport. It operates flights to Indonesia and Malaysia, as well as private flights and a flight training school. Otherwise, the country has an incredibly complex and highly operational network of roads, rail lines, and shipping docks. There are two bridges that connect nice. to Malaysia over the Johor Strait. You have the busiest one going into the city of Johor Bahru at the Johor Causeway Bridge in the north, and then you have the second link bridge toll road that enters into the west side. People uh, I heard, like, uh, also Malaysia is going to be building... Something really large here, if I do recall, like a large wealthy residential neighborhood that like might link up with uh, Singapore as well. But I mean, they basically were one country at one point. But Paul will get into that more. But uh, you know, basically they were kicked out. I'll just shorten it here. They were kicked out of Malaysia. And uh, they got wealthy afterwards. There you go. <laughs> End of story. People usually take this road to go to Legoland, Malaysia. After Shanghai, Singapore has the world's Legoland? second largest shipping container port, able to transport nearly 40 million containers annually. From there, many other commercial ports are used for the public, like the Harbor Front Center and the Marina Bay Cruise Center. Now, you so can't talk ports, about Singapore without <laughs> mentioning the MRT, the oldest, busiest, and most costly rail system in Southeast Asia. It also has the longest driverless network in the world and some of the deepest subway tunnels in the world. And finally, Thanks. fun fact. Christmas Island and the Cocos and Keeling Islands were at one point a part of Singapore under British rule, but then were transferred to Australia in 1957. For real though, the airport is so cool. So, going back to infrastructure. Singapore is kind of internationally renowned for having very strict laws when it comes to things like car and home ownership. Yeah, strict laws such as you can go to jail if you like. Uh, is uh, Actually, I think chewing gum is not allowed at all because I know it's because they want to keep their streets clean and I definitely agree like that if you basically if in any city you go you look at the like the 
the sidewalks are just full of like bu- bubble gum that has like a dried up in, into the in, into the uh, actual sidewalk. And so they b- outlawed bubble gum, freaking bubble gum, <laughs> just 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 to keep their streets clean. I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of bubble gum, but you know, it's a it's a way to keep your streets clean, I guess. Basically, all cars are required to have an IU or in-vehicle unit, a device that's installed in the windshield and is basically a prepaid account that has money deducted from it when you drive under the ERP toll passes. On top of that, that owning a car is pretty difficult enough as it is. Here is Ben to explain. Um, the government highly advocates for the use of public transportation like the buses and the metro system, smart, which smart. in Singapore we call the we call the MRT. And on top of that, in order to regulate um, the number of car owners and the number of cars on the road. In Singapore, if one wants to buy a car, we not only have to pay for the car itself, we have to pay for the certificate of entitlement. And that certificate, that piece of paper, can go up to $30,000. For a piece of paper. <laughs> That's co- uh, that costs more than my car. I don't have a car, but <laughs> you know what I mean. But uh, just straight up, uh, well, then it didn't outlaw cars, but it looks like to me it's very difficult to own a car. Now, Cars nowadays might be a better idea than public transit because you, the you know what virus is still about. So, like they they highly suggest like don't use like a public transit. That's one of the number one places where you can like actually get the virus. I read in an article top ten places where you can get the coronavirus. One of them is actually public public transport. So, um, is it good? Is it not good? Like I know like. I think Greece or Athens. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did something like this where they just outright banned cars at one point. I read it in an article, <laughs> but um, I guess it's one way to keep pollution pollution levels low. Now here in Bosnia and Sarajevo, where basically everybody has a car, the pollution can get insane. Like the the, the rate of uh, lung diseases in Bosnia is a lot higher than other nations due to that. It's one of the most, uh, despite Sarajevo not really having large, you know, industrial stinky coal plants or whatever they still have a lot of cars and it's really like in between the mountains so it just pollutes everything so i don't know maybe sarajevo can model itself on singapore Hmm? because i because i prefer like public transport anyway besides the virus otherwise the public public transit is probably the number one way to go and that thirty thousand dollars actually varies according to the season because what happens is this coe often goes by a balloting system and this coe lasts for a period of 10 years after 10 years you have the option of renewing the coe for another five years or you have to scrape the car and get a new car and get another new coe for another 10 years so da 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 crazy rich agent and Ben, about home ownership, explain. How does it work in Singapore? What's the HDB? Go. If I am not wrong, I think 90% of the land here in Singapore belongs to the country. HDB is in charge of building apartments, build apartment buildings for um, most Singaporeans to live in. So about 80 80- Now, I, I, one thing I hope about uh, Singaporean like, uh, housing that is not similar to like uh, Hong Kong housing where they have like... Uh, basically my studio size room that I have here worth of space. Th- that's crazy. How, how do people live like that? 80% of the Singaporean populations and these flats or these apartments, um, we may say that we own it, but technically it's a lease for 99 years. But considering that the country isn't even 99 years old in itself, nobody oh. quite knows exactly what a completion of lease would look like, but yeah. And that is how we may... Why is it always 99 years? Like Hong Kong was leased for 99 years, then Sri Lanka leased that port to China for like 99 years. Over here, it's like you can lease a, a house or an apartment for 99 years. Just make it 100. <laughs> is that a big deal? Manage to, you know, keep everyone one my OCD sheltered. thank you Ben this means housing operates easier and faster <coughs> because you don't have to worry about red tape issues like department approval or ordinance laws basically the point of real estate in Singapore is you buy to live not really to invest yeah you will never see one of those HGTV flipper shows airing here in any case time to move on to the famous places segment the fountain of wealth orchard road has like the best shopping Chinatown with the street market and Buddha tooth relic temple and museum Kampong Glam with Haji Lane and the Sultan mosque little India with the Mustafa Center and the Sri Vir- 
Hiro Makamiya Talk about multiculturalism. Temple, Villa, Universal Studios, The Night Safari, The Henderson Waves, Jurong Bird Park, Marina Bay Sands, and the rooftop Infinity Pool. So many museums, cemeteries, and art galleries. And probably the most iconic landmark, the gardens by the bay. Those the look super epic. trees and the cloud forest and flower dome. Yeah, those super trees are really cool. I was lucky enough to see them when I visited. It's <coughs> I mean, those trees are... Well, artificial first and foremost, but semi-artificial, if you know what I mean. But there are, they also make like buildings similar to this. Like they actually make the buildings on the side, like have a lot of greenery and everything. Now, afterwards, we figured out that's not really a good idea to build like apartments or whatever out of a lot of greenery because what else likes greenery other than, you know, humans? A lot of mosquitoes, a lot of flies, a lot of pests enjoy them. So people have their basically their apartments full of mosquitoes. Because they have way too much of this greenery on top of their... Uh, there's probably better solutions for, like, global warming than putting that on top of a building. I don't know. Probably best to, like, for people to empty the the villages and go into the cities and the villages and whatever can have the shrubbery and trees grow back after a long while. <laughs> Maybe that's a better solution than... Than that. I'm not saying these these trees don't look cool. The, the trees do look cool and they should stay up. I'm talking about buildings specifically. It's crazy how much Singapore puts an I emphasis go on, on coalescing so concrete with nature. Which brings us to... What the? Now Singapore gets its name from the word Singapura, derived from Sanskrit meaning Lion City. Even though there's no lions here. Nobody knows exactly why it's called Singapore then, but the more popular theory comes from the Malay annals claiming that this guy sailed here and in yeah. the 13th century it was like, whoa. I think I see a lion. Is it was actually a, a tiger. No, there are no lions in this part of the world. That must have been a tiger. No, nah, too late. I already saw it. I already made up my mind in Singapore. So yeah, that's basically it. In any case. I mean, tigers are larger than lions. If you didn't know, they actually are slightly larger than lions. So I don't know. Tiger City? What would it sound like then? If it's not Singapore Lion City, what would, it, what would Tiger City be? <laughs> How do you say a tiger in in that language, I don't know, something poor. <laughs> For Singapore, with limited space comes limited environmental responsibility. Here's the uh, motion graphic. First of all, as the country is heavily urbanized, Singapore has lost about 90% of its historical forests, and the majority of what's left oh. is found either in the Sungai Bulo wetland or the Bukit Timah bit. Nature Reserve and the surrounding green areas in the center of the main island. Speaking of which, here you can find the highest point, Bukit Timah Hill, at about 163 meters tall. This notable area in the center of the country has the most well-known freshwater <laughs> reservoirs that supply the inhabitants of the country, like the McRitchie Reservoir, the Central Water Catchment, and the Upper Selatar Reservoir. However, it is this one, the Lower Pierce Reservoir, that is the source of the longest river of the country, the Kalang River, they have a river? which is more like a controlled still creek flowing about 10 kilometers down to the largest body of fresh water, the Marina Bay Reservoir, which is actually fed by five rivers. This reservoir alone supplies about 10% oh, of the country's fresh water needs. It started in 2008 with salt water, but then in two years, they desalinated and drained the remaining salt water. The Freshwater Bay is contained from the saltwater sea only by a narrow dam called the Marina Barrage, only about 10 meters wide. Keep in mind, really this guy Dutch. over here, the Pandan Reservoir to the west, contains more water and surface area, but the water is non-potable and is used to service the industrial sector. As the island only lies about one and a half degrees north of the equator, they have a tropical rainforest climate with relative uniform temperatures throughout the year. However, for nine months of the year, they experience two monsoon seasons between November to March and June to September. On top of that, they have an average 84.2 humidity level and it's not uncommon to go up to 100 percent especially on rainy days yep pretty rainy in fact there's even a saying by the rain by the sweat either way you will get wet it's like florida i'm like florida man i think yes <laughs> keith you you are florida man for what it's worth though as the country becomes more urban and developed they are trying to preserve as much nature as they can which is kind of a challenge i mean it's like skyscrapers coming up everywhere what are you gonna do one very creative way they've been doing so is through the tactic of fusing their concrete and steel foundations with living hedges of flora what the hell am i doing with my hands to explain more guess who's back noah <laughs> How about that? That's happening more often. Let's now. get to it. With Singapore, the very continuity of their country depends on balance. They have taken many steps to integrate vertical greenery and as much space as they can. You can see this in many places like the Oasia Hotel downtown. Yeah, this is what I've been talking about. growing all over the grilled exterior. In addition, there actually are a few <laughs> small plots of land designated for agriculture, mostly in the northwest quadrant of the country. Here, there are over 2,000 farms, averaging about two and a half acres each. Nonetheless, they invest heavily in the finance, technology, business, and service sectors. The country puts a huge emphasis on encouraging entrepreneurs. 
dollars with free trade policies and easily accessible government grants and funds. They have the third least corrupt economy with low tax rates. In addition, all workers under 55 are required to give 20% of their wages to the central provident fund, which is a social savings fund like a pension. Employers give 17% of earnings. So long story short, these are some of the main factors that made the country so prosperous so fast. And speaking of fast, here comes our animal correspondent, Gary Harlow. Here we are with Puppy Harlow. <laughs> now, with a country that's over 90% urbanized, you would think that animals would have no way of thriving here. But you're wrong, and don't you forget. Pigeons because can of the thrive. Climate, <laughs> Singapore is still able to host over 60 mammals, nearly 400 bird species, and about 110 reptiles, 30 amphibians. Most of the animals live in one of the five established nature reserves four on the main island, and one on Palawawa. <laughs> Pulau Ubin. The most common mammal right, you'll Ramstein. probably find are long-tailed macaque monkeys. Just, just for the record, these are actually pronounced macaque monkeys. I'm not how they're pronouncing. I, I searched it up. It's actually macaque. They're not saying that because reasons. <laughs> if you're lucky, you might come across one of the incredibly rare Sunda pangolins. That uh. Besides bass, I assume the COVID actually might have come from pangolins. So, careful with those. Don't eat those. Don't eat them. They're highly protected. And along certain westland areas, you can find otters. Otter. <laughs> Was that an otter sound? Nonetheless, out of all these real animals, the national animal of the country is the mere lion. A fictional creature that's half lion, half fish. Speaking of legendary cool. creatures, we go back to Noah Gildemaster, the master of guilds. Thanks, Gary. Tell Caleb I say hi. And with that, it's the time you hungry people have all been waiting for. Food! Singapore takes food seriously. Let's put it this way. Some people come into Singapore doesn't? just for the food. Now, usually I take on this segment, but Singaporean Kevin knows his food. So I'm going to pass this over to him. Kevin, take it away. So over here, we have an incredibly rich history of mixing different flavors from our different people groups and some of the best places to try this is what we would call a hawker center a hawker center is basically a big food court that's filled with many many stalls or push carts for people to choose different foods from some of these small venues are even michelin star rated there are over 107 <laughs> hawker centers also i found out the michelin star is uh who who owns michelin star is basically a, a tire manufacturer in france that uh, a tire manufacturer is giving out Michelin stars, which I had no idea was the case. I mean, I don't know what, what they have to do with cooking, but oh, okay, I guess. <laughs> in Singapore, but the largest one is the Chinatown Complex Food Center that houses more than 260 mini stalls. The next time you come to Singapore, you have to try some of our local food. The ones that we're most well known for are laksa, chicken rice, rojak, chakwe tiao, Hokkien mee, chicken clay pot rice, chendol, ice kacang, roti prata, murtabak. By the way, nobody here actually drinks the Singapore sling. It's basically a touristy gimmick. Thanks, Kevin. Never even heard yeah, of one. Lots okay. of fusion with Singapore. Let's discuss more on that in the next segment, shall we? Oh, why, thank you, Mr. Noah. In the words of fiction writer William Gibson, Singapore is like Disneyland with a death penalty. It's shiny, it's pretty, it's clean, it's efficient, but it does kind of come at a cost of heavy restrictions okay. and somewhat authoritarian and technocratic protocol. This kind of puts Singapore in a weird state of... Yes, because when Singapore was kicked out of basically Malaysia, uh, it was somewhat dictatorial in nature. The country was dictatorial, but actually managed to make the place wealthy. It's similar to Yugoslavia, sure, a dictator was the head of the state, but made the country a lot more prosperous. I guess Singapore had something like that. Of like prosperity at the cost of certain societal compromises. It's a hard topic to address because there's so many layers that go into it. And I suggest you just talk to a Singaporean if we want to know more. On top of that, everything kind of functions in four fours. Clearly you could tell by now there's nothing in here. I'm just using it as a prop. Sad, I know. We'll get more into that in a bit. But first, the graph. Singapore has a population just under 6 million and often Ooh, ranks as the lot. number one or number two spot for the country with the lowest fertility rate on... I mean, where are you going to put all the kids? Because, you know, there's not enough... There's not going to be enough space for many, many more people. Usually the fertility rate is low when, whenever you have an urbanized country because... It's not as easy as you think to start a family, being that you have to first secure yourself with a apartment or whatnot, and then only you can think about having a family. But yeah, by the time you secure an apartment, how old are you going to be? 
So, yeah. Earth with only about 0.9 children per couple. It also ranks number one as the most competitive economy I mean, on they have Earth, with a spot in the top probably. five highest GDP per capita countries as well. The largest group of people in the country identify as ethnically Chinese, but keep in mind this number also includes an undetermined percentage of people that are mixed with Chinese, like the Peranakan. From there, the next. Now, the Chinese got there, I believe, by when the British took over the. Singapore, what we know today, uh, they brought over a lot of Chinese worker from main, Chinese workers from mainland China to you know work the place if you if you know what I mean. But there were there weren't many uh, people that uh, occupied the what is today Singapore before the the British basically took the Chinese and plopped them there. Next largest group are the Malays, somewhere around 13.5%. Keep in mind this category also may include Indonesian migrants that register as Malays though. And the third largest group are the Indians at around 10%, mostly South Tamil and Malayalam speaking Indians. However, keep in mind this registered also category may also include British. general Indian subcontinent individuals from other countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. From there, the remainder of the population are other groups, mainly Eurasians, Caucasians, Japanese, Koreans, Filipinos, and Vietnamese. They use the Singapore dollar as their currency, which by by the way is pegged and interchangeable with the Brunei dollar. They use the type G plug outlet and they drive on the left side of the road. Remember, they were once a British territory. The country has four as official I've languages, saying. each pertaining to the main ethnic groups. They are Mandarin, Malay, Tamil, and English. Nobody does this. Why is this a four for me? And there's technically a fifth way of speaking, Singlish, which is kind of like an English Creole that mixes all the languages. Okay, here's the guys explaining. So in Singapore, there is a local slang that's called Singlish. And Singlish is basically English that incorporates elements of Chinese or Malay into it. Like la, which we use as an emphasis I heard that. before I heard that a lot. after a sentence. For example, the weather is so hot la. Aya, xiao a. Got so many of these terms you go online and check, okay? Like similar to Bosnia, we always say ba at the end. <laughs> Jesse ba. The ba doesn't mean anything. We just, you know, always put it at the end of our sentences for some reason. I'm assuming that that's what's going on here. I'm very tired now. Another way of speaking is by mixing the different languages we have here in the country together. Uncle, we are eating teh o bing. So uncle is in English. Wo yao yi bei is Mandarin. They all go song bing. It's a mixture of dialect Hokkien and also the Malay language. Now, when you're buying food in a hawker centre and you're not going to be able to eat there and you need to take away, you can tell the uncle that you need to da pao. Uncle, one chicken rice, please. Da pao. Thank you guys. Now, in a way, you can oh kind of see God, Singapore as a tri-ethnic or plurinational country. Kind of like Belgium with the Walloons and Flemish or Bosnia and Herzegovina with the Serbs, Croats and Bosnians. Actually, Bosnia and Herzegovina is not the best example because all three are basically the same thing. But you get the point. And the country is kind of calibrated to preserve this social... We're basically the same thing. I don't know about same thing, but definitely our political interests are way different. That's what really divides us. But hey, let's not get into Bosnia now. Social structure. Like, you're required to register your ethnic group on your papers and passport. This has been kind of like a slight inconvenience for some people of mixed ancestry, like the Peranakan, which are kind of like descendants between Chinese and Malays. And they're kind of like their own unique people group. However, these days, more people are mixing ethnic lines and giving birth to biracial children. This has led to them adding a mixed race option on paperwork in 2011, which adds a whole new dimension to society. And uh, yeah, here's Nigel explaining a little bit more on that. Today, the four most common languages are English, Malay, Chinese, and Tamil. Now, these languages can be seen on the street signs, advertisements, and public notices. We also have dialects, which are spoken but unwritten languages. In school, students are taught the importance of racial harmony. And we also have a day which celebrates this diversity. Our history began with the Malays as the first inhabitants. People from China, Malays India, first. Europe, and other countries started settling down in the early 19th century. When it comes to housing, it's quite natural for people to want to live in a community where their neighbors speak the same language. So did the British actually bring them over or did they move over from what I'm hearing? I don't know. Language and share the I just heard they culture. got but there the during the British time. Days, an ethnic quota was implemented for public housing. So a certain ratio is assigned to each block, denominating the percentage of Malays, Chinese, Indians and other races. And by doing this, none of the three major ethnic groups were disadvantaged. Every race is now represented in each neighborhood. Thank you, Nigel. Yeah, the racial For quota. Me, that's bizarre. Unfortunately, this also means depending on your race, it could be easier or harder to buy a home depending on the location. It's kind of like a weird thing that nobody really likes to talk about, but everybody knows that race can kind of be used in this way in Singapore. It's it's the way how it is. In any case, all of this is obviously okay. enforced through the government, which is kind of like a tight, semi-autocratic one-party system called the People's Action Party. 
<laughs> it kind of looks like uh, the Captain America's sign or, or shield or whatever, just with the lightning bolt. <laughs> it has been the dominant party since they forcefully gained independence against their will. That's right, after the British left in 1959, they deliberately wanted to unify with Malaysia, but then it was like, seriously, you're imposing a 20% revenue contribution hike on my fiscal input and have imposed the Bumiputara policy? Pretty sketchy, dude. Well, this is Malay territory and you did want to join our federation. And even after we agreed on a level of autonomy, you still had the nerve to be an indignant little That's not possible. That's no, Whatever because you listen, if you, if you, you look at the facts, so the facts. Okay. Hey, that's it. I'm kicking you out. Parliament, vote. No! I just wanted to negotiate different terms. What are you doing? No! No! Oh well, you got rich. It Who is cares? with great sadness that I must announce that our little island has now gained independence. Oh no. <laughs> A little exaggerated, but literally Lee Kuan Yew was like sad during his announcement. He was even quoted for saying it was a moment of anguish. But any Huang Long, faith-wise, the nation is also quite mixed up as well. The largest group being Buddhists at around a third of the country. The second largest group is actually Christians at nearly a fifth of the country's population. And from there, Islam comes in at third at about 14% of the country. Rounding out at number four, about 7% are Hindus, mostly from the Indian community. So yeah, that's that. All right, enough from me. In any case, now it's time for the sports part. Usually Art fills in for this segment but he is literally driving back to LA. He's coming home. And uh, as you know, he can't film while he's in a car. So we need a substitute, which means uh, we're gonna need someone to come in. I guess it's gonna be you, Ian. Ian, hey, fill in right. for the sports part. Sports part with Ian. As a small There's country a that puts now? more of a cultural focus on business and finance, sports are usually pushed off with less of a national priority. Nonetheless, everything from bodybuilding to badminton can oh, be yeah. found here competition-wise. Their soccer, or football team, were four-time winners of the it's AFF football. championships. <laughs> a, otherwise, you can see native sports too, like foot volleyball or sepak takra. Yeah, oh wow, you got it. And nice scissor martial kick. art salat, native to Indonesia and Malaysia, are often done here as well. As an island nation, though swimming and water related activities have always been their specialty nothing was more glorious for the country when joseph schooling was able to not only compete with but beat the man he looked up to michael phelps in the 100 meter butterfly event at the 2016 olympics we still love you michael I phelps guess. you're awesome well thanks for my having god me. he has enough Sorry, gold there here. good luck driving uh but do this to make a gold thank bar. you <laughs> yes. oh, i need time and he hua. The cool thing about Singapore is that the people all kind of bring something to the table that everyone can enjoy on a national level. Enough on that from me though, it's time to hand the reins over to our culture correspondent, Random Hannah. Party people, it is good to be back. Yeah. So as mentioned, Singapore is a diverse country, but there are a few things that kind of unite them all. It's said Singaporeans all have the five great fears. Kia Su, meaning the fear of missing out, FOMO. Kia Si, meaning the fear of death. I Kia Bo, fear of having nothing. Kia Cheng Hu, fear of government. Fear of government. And Kia Bor, meaning the fear of your wife. Over here in like Europe, it's like the government should have a fear of its people, so. It's opposite land over there, it seems. Fear of wife. <laughs> oh, but that's actually... <laughs> uh, yeah, I understand that one. I mean, I don't have a wife, but still. Wife, do you fear me or no? no. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably a good thing. I don't want you to be afraid of me. This She's going to get me with one of those rolling pins. <laughs> two favorite pastimes, queuing and choping. They hate missing out. It is said that if there's a long line, it has to be for something good. You don't even have to know what the line is for. And choke probably is the art of securing a seat during meal times at restaurants. It's I know that feeling. Dash. Every man and woman for themselves. To reserve a seat, people will usually place cheap personal items like a pack of tissue or a pen to claim a table. We totally do that here. Due to the former colonial ties to the British, you might notice much of Singaporean culture is anglicized. For example, many people may choose to give English first names to their children. In addition, much of the traditional architecture is a fusion that blends hints of British and Asia. None more exemplified better than the 20th century style shop house. These narrow structures are known for having covered walkways called five foot ways to help residents stay dry during the rain while shopping. Um, Certain festivals that's are celebrated by Europe. everyone too, like the Heritage and Food Festivals in July. Their version of Black Friday is called the Great Singapore Sale, where things go up to 70% off. 
I'd like that. And you can't forget their national Seven day, percent. August 9th, commemorating their independence. Singapore also, in a way, has a culture of appreciating discipline. Crime rates are very low in Singapore, partially because ramifications can be severe. And Just like Belarus. And punishment is common and accepted, even in schools. Sometimes Singapore is called the fine city because you can get fines for certain things like, oh, I thought it was <laughs> urinating fines. on a you lift. You can get fines <laughs> for eating or drinking on the MRT, playing loud, annoying music in public, <laughs> chewing or selling gum unless it's prescription. Also, technically, Singapore does not have a complete freedom of speech. Even when making debates at Speaker's Corner in Honglin Park, they must register the topic with the government prior to speaking and are still monitored. Nonetheless, the country moves forward pretty well, even amidst these seemingly harsh policies. They want to maintain order, and for them, the best way is to do it this way, the Singapore way. <laughs> the one person that will never be in order is Keith. So here is Keith's music segment. Whee! Okay, disclaimer, by the way, I love Funkadelic. They should warn me. Band. George Friend. Clinton is an amazing keyboard player. Due to fair use law, don't sue. That's my commentary. Goodbye. The music culture of Singapore is special because it takes influences from the Chinese, Malays, and Indians. In the early 20th century, traditional Chinese street opera troops would set up and perform either in music clubs or during festivals. The art has declined in the past few decades, but you can still find some performances being done, especially at the Chinese opera institute or the chinese theater circle near downtown for the malay community it's not uncommon to hear ensembles performances called don dong sayan and keron jong these are usually done at special events and weddings for the indian community south indian raga ballads are not uncommon and north indian bangra dances are usually seen at special events as well in a more contemporary sense though in this 1960s they basically had a wannabes beatles band you know what i'm saying <laughs> that's what i thought just kidding, kind of. Artists oh, no, started to experiment with bilingual lyrics and pop music in bands like Crescendos and October Cherries. For a while in the 1980s and 1990s, a new genre inspired by Taiwanese country music called Xingyao swept Singapore by storm. Today, pop music has become a more progressive genre with many artists singing in English. They even won the first and only season of, you know, Asian Idol. I could only imagine the Asian Simon Cowell. Ha ha. <laughs> Recently, many metal bands like Iron Maiden, Slayer, and Dream Theater have made Singapore a stop on international tours, which has led to a new interest in metal amongst the teenage nah, angsty youth. About. In any case, <laughs> the most important venue for musical performances today would be the Esplanade, located right on Marina Bay downtown. All right, that's it for me. My name is Keith, and as you can see, we have these wonderful Keith shirts. You can wear this shirt on a train and maybe even a plane. Later! Thank you, Keith and Hannah. Whew. And now, famous people. We're just gonna kind of rush through this. Historical and political figures like these. There's a lot of actors like these. I know none Remember of them. Remember Jet Li got <gasps> citizenship. Oh, I thought he was Eichel's from there. actually born here too. And for authors, you know, the guy who wrote Crazy Rich Asians. And there's a lot more. And speaking no, of I knew he crazy... Was, and I knew he was from China. I'm just saying... I, for a second there, I thought he was actually born there. And rich and Asians. Let's talk about Singapore's diplomatic outreach. Oh, another John. ad incoming. Kill me. <laughs> Singapore has virtually no conflicts with any other country, and today they have diplomatic relations with 189 countries. For what's worth though, they know how to play the global chessboard pretty well. For one, they are a member of the Commonwealth of Nations, which of course opens up their ties to 54 other nations across the world in shared cooperation treaties. Generally, other Anglophone nations get along with Singapore all around the world, from Africa to the Caribbean, back to Europe. This means of course that the UK is a close ally. They have a mutual defense agreement called the Five Power Defense Arrangement, which includes Australia, New Zealand, and Malaysia. They are the fourth largest investor in business with high levels of stock ownership. Many Singaporeans also either study abroad in the UK or even have family and live in the UK. The USA is a huge partner with a free trade agreement and the military cooperates frequently. Singapore's Air Force has a detachment in Arizona's Luke Air Force Base and the US Navy is allowed to use Singapore's ports. China and specifically Hong Kong are both very close friends, obviously as the majority of the population in Singapore are of Chinese descent, mostly of the southern parts of China like Fujian, Guangdong, and Hainan. Collectively, China and Hong Kong are also the largest trading partners, reaching about $100 billion in revenue. Nonetheless, relations kind of fluctuate depending on how much interaction Singapore has with Taiwan. Singapore does have military facilities in Taiwan, and in 2004, they put bilateral relations on hold when the former prime minister took a private trip to Taipei. Hong Kong, though, is kind of like the cousin across the sea, as both were former UK colonies, and they have very similar structures in the way how they function with business and government. India, of course, is a close friend as well, not only due to the 
the diaspora population of Indians in Singapore, but with huge economic ties as well. In the 90s, India initiated the Look East policy, in which they decided to expand its commercial, cultural, and military ties to Southeast Asia. With that, it's probably safe to say the closest countries to Singapore would probably be their fellow ASEAN members, more specifically Malaysia and Indonesia. Now, with Indonesia and Malaysia, there is kind of like a siege mentality of past unfavorable events, like the Borneo conflict of 63 that Singapore was kind of dragged into, but they've generally moved on and moved forward. All Never three countries operate conflict. along the Strait of Malacca, the busiest choke point of trade in the world, so they all kind of have to work together. Indonesia is the... Yes, and this is one of the reasons how uh, Singapore became super rich, because as you can see here, the Strait of Malacca, largest like trading uh, route in the world for shipping, of course, around 20% of all trade in the world goes right through there. So it's kind of easy mode for Singapore, if you know what I mean, just, beca <clears throat> just because of geography. Well, it, some countries got rich despite their ge geography, but you know what I mean. Geography is very important for for uh, making it in the world. Third largest trading partner and in 2005 signed a memorandum of understanding. Lots of important resources come from Indonesia and many Indonesians get along with the Malay Singaporeans as they have very similar cultures. Malaysia on the other hand is kind of like the divorced wife that decided to stay in a business relationship. They are the second largest business partner. Each country like is able Bezos. to easily <laughs> cross borders and immigrate. The Malays often have family on the other side and intermarry. Singaporeans love crossing into Johor to shop where everything is like a quarter of the price it would be in Singapore, and overall, the awkwardness of the breakup is pretty much non existent to this day. All three of these countries are solid together. By the way, I just realized one of you guys sent me this hat. I should have worn it for the whole video. In conclusion, with Singapore, everything is kind of about balancing, you know, infrastructure, nature, culture, and the future with the right amount of negotiation, compensation, and discipline. It's just kind of how they do things here. Stay tuned, Fair Slovakia. Enough. Is coming up next now i don't know when it's going to come out slovakia i i heard like uh he went on a break for a very long time i guess he needed a break for whatever reason so um yeah i don't know when he's gonna when the new episodes are gonna come out but i think he said he was done with the script now he just needs to like film them because i i will definitely do slovakia a fellow <laughs> slavic nation and there's slovenia right after that a fellow southern slavic nation and uh, yeah, well, I'll definitely do those uh, when they come out, but I don't know when they're going to come out. So I I, I really don't, uh, I'll just get into it now, but I don't really do reactions to other uh, channels because nowadays a lot of things are like copyrightable on YouTube, especially like reacting to different uh, channels unfortunately like you can get like a copyright strike or or you can't earn any revenue whatsoever from that so i usually that's why that's one of the reasons i usually just stick to geography now for because so far geography now has been the most lenient when it comes to you know copyright strikes and whatnot so so like uh until then i guess i'll just have to be figuring out what i'm going to do with uh my channel probably going to be doing some videos on my own i'm not going to be going into reaction i'm actually just going to doing something similar to what Paul is doing now. But I don't know when I'll be done with the first script. Uh, wink, wink. There, there's a little bit of a a spoiler there, or a teaser, I guess you can say. I don't know when I'm going to be done. I don't know if by the end of this year. I'll try by the end of this year. If not, probably we'll just see, see each other in the next year. Or if Slovakia comes out before the end of the year, then I'm going to be doing that one. But anyway, let's just finish off with the flag and then we'll call it a day. Now, the Singaporean flag, I always thought like the usually when you see a crescent moon and something like a star, it represents Islam. But for like Singapore, I heard that's not really the case. But I swear, the first time I saw that, I thought it had something to do with Islam. Because usually when you think of Islamic symbols, the number one you think of is the crescent moon with a star. So, And they have like five stars in the shape of a star, but you know what I mean. Hey everybody, welcome back to Flag Slash Fan Friday. Hope you liked the Singapore episode. Ah, that was oh, pretty good. Yes, yeah, I'm wearing a Geography Now shirt and a Geography Now drawstring bag and a Geography Now mug, all of which you can get at GeographyNow.com. Do you have, Come like, on. Geography it's Now? I should probably check. As you know, there's the part Hoodies. where I talk about the things that didn't quite make it into the episode or the small mistakes. First of all, mispronunciation. It's Esplanade, not Esplanade. My mistake. Second of the all, durian. the PNG image of Singapore we used in the friend zone. Is oh, yeah, the durian. Uh, that's like one... Isn't that like that fruit that stinks? A lot is like large and spiky but it actually like stinks but they say it doesn't taste as bad as it stinks but still that sounds bad 
I don't know. It's actually an old cutout. You know, the Tuas Peninsula is more extended and has more land reclaimed, as does Tekong Island. And also they have a new shipping container terminal jutting out in the sea at the Pasir Panjang area. And speaking of which, fast. I kind of want to talk more about what each of the main non-inhabited islands are used for. For example, Tekong and Sudong are both military bases. Bukom and Seborok are oil. Yes, and that's one thing. Uh, I believe every uh, male, I think female as well, correct me if I'm wrong, when they reach the age of... 18, they have to go to military training for like two years. So despite, you know, being a, a small nation, it has a quite a formidable military force because of that reason, because, uh, you know, they have to actually serve time in the military where, whereas most of Europe uh, or like the West in general nowadays doesn't have obligatory uh, military service. It's all voluntary at this point. But uh, I don't know. But similar to like Israel, like sometimes people meet each other like you can meet up with other people while you're in the army and you could talk about your dreams hopes and dreams and maybe somebody will uh, you know agree with your hopes and dreams and try to work with you and that's one way you can forge a business partnership as israel has proven that's a good way to actual form like uh, you know find business partners that's a good way to make friends while you're in the military same goes for like singapore oil and petrochemical stock sites the smallest and furthest south island satumu is nothing but a single lighthouse and a guest center so macau is the country's only landfill and it's actually kind of like a tourist spot for some reason and of course about pulau ubin uh, it's actually a cool tourist spot <laughs> and there are no vehicles allowed unless if it's like a government maintenance vehicle so the only way to get around is you have to use a bicycle they Parking. rent bicycles oh, right at the entrance of the, the but ferry I had to walk. Pier. the malays are a protected people group under article 152 and so is the religion of islam it act they actually have a separate sharia court and marriage registries in singapore and also for singaporeans some of them have dual citizenship but by the time they reach 18 they have to decide which country they want to have citizenship toward totally forgot to mention singapore is a conscription country all males are if required i had waited to serve one minute <laughs> starting at the age of 18 for two years now we did kind of bypass the history segment of singapore in the episode partially because you know nigel kind of talked about it a little bit in his segment but i mean i guess i kind of forgot to mention that singapore was also under various other kingdoms and the British came in and Malaysia was also British so they kind of cooperated <laughs> and then finally independent anyway now we're going to talk about the flag so without further uh naturally good lucius the tier kill me intensive na njega za prirodnu hidrataciju kože i do i need to get ad block seriously <laughs> Ah, this was such a fun episode to film. It brought back all the memories of hanging out with Ben and Nigel. Anyway, the flag. The flag of Singapore consists of two horizontal bands, a red one on top of a white. The red symbolizes universal brotherhood and equality of man, whereas the white stands for the everlasting purity and virtue of the country. In the upper left corner, a white crescent moon and five white stars in a circle pattern can be found. The crescent moon serves to signify Singapore's status as a young and up-and-coming nation, and the five stars in a circle represent the ideals of democracy, peace, progress, justice, and okay, equality. So now, keep in mind, prior to this, they had variants of the Union Jack flag with the British East India Company flag, which also kind of looks like the flag of Hawaii. Then they were under Japan for like three years in World War II, then tossed back to the British, and then Malaysia, and then back to being independent accidentally. We explained it in the episode. Yeah. The, yeah. So anyway, now moving on to the coat of arms. In the center of the coat of arms is a red shield with the same oh, flag configuration <laughs> of a crescent and stars, meaning the same things that they do on the flag, obviously. On the sides are a lion and and a tiger. The tiger symbolizes the nation's historical and close connections to Malaysia, which Singapore was a state of from 1963 to 65, while the lion represents Singapore in itself, as the name comes from Sanskrit, meaning Lion City, even though lions are not native to Singapore. Again, we also explained this in the episode. Below is the national motto, Majula Singapura, which is written in gold. It means onward Singapore in Malay, one of the four national languages of Singapore. And that's pretty much the coat of arms they've had since independence. So yeah, that's just about it. And you know what that means? Now it's time for yeah. the end of the video because I don't really do the uh, uh, fan mail or whatever or the geography now fan mail. You can watch that yourself in your own free time. I have nothing to commentate uh, when it comes to that. So I will. I always watch those on my own time. So I'll be watching this right after. Th I haven't seen this episode, by the way, uh, ever since it came out. Uh, the, the flag flesh fan, fan fright, I haven't looked at it at all. So it would. it's completely new to me. But anyway... That's besides the point. Uh, I'm a lot healthier. I feel much healthier. I can do stuff much more. I can I can go back to my regular schedule program. So, but so I'll expect another video if Slovakia comes out. If I manage to finish the script first, which 
I want you guys to, you know, hold me hostage in case I don't actually finish with the script first and actually start doing my own videos. I want you guys to hold me hostage and make sure I actually do that this time because I've been promising it time and time again and I never gotten around to do it. I always was busy, always was got sick, but with pneumonitis, it sucked so much. But now I think I can finally get back to doing what I, you know, what I was doing beforehand. So uh, I'll see you guys. It's when Savlakia, when Savlakia comes out. Uh, Merry Christmas to those who celebrate Christmas. Uh, Happy New Year, if in case I don't make a video by the time of New Year. Um, like I said, I will be doing a moment of silence because uh, this year was terrible. <laughs> we don't know what the next year can bring. Many people hope it's going to be, I hope so too, it's going to be a lot better, but you can't never tell. This year was just holy hell. No comment. Honestly, it was like one of the worst years of my life. I'll just say they're one of the worst years. I, I despise 2020, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> but I uh, hope you guys are staying safe to avoid corona. Follow all the uh, guidelines or whatever. Do not catch it because it can be very, very bad. I've, I've been through pneumonitis. I can confirm. Very bad. It's not a joke, as one of the comments said. It is not a joke. That is a killer even to young people. So, <sighs> I have nothing else to say. I haven't talked to you guys in a while. That's why I'm still going <laughs> going on. But okay, I think that I've said everything I needed to say. My camera didn't die this time. Yes, I made sure to charge it this time. <laughs> so no embarrassments for me. Well, those ads were a bit of a pain, but still, what can you do? Anyway, guys, I'll see you in Slovakia or whenever, whenever I upload the next video. So uh, until then, take care.